but the refractors, if in fact they were evidence of refractors involving two segments here, try and evaluate what are the proper questions. What is the formation of the clot within the, the venous system in the leg that propagates itself all the way up into the, into the inferior vena cable and goes to the lungs itself. That in itself can either cause showering pulmonary embolus, which results in mild shortness of breath and sometimes mild hemoptysis, meaning spitting up a little bit of blood. But more, more importantly, we're not able to be spitting up because we have this endotracheal tube. But we've got to be aware at all times that this is one of the major complications and cause of sudden death, especially massive pulmonary emboli. Shower pulmonary emboli can cause shortness of breath and mild hemoptysis. In addition to that, if you've had fractures to the ribs, remember the most important thing at this stage is to make sure that the lung functions return to normal. What we're looking at at that stage is to make sure that it's vigorous, vigorous pulmon pulmonary exercise. But in terms of breathing, that same um, breathing mechanism, the incentive spirometry at the side of the bed, every 10 minutes, you breathe in as massively as you possibly can to re-expand the lungs. If you do not re-expand the lungs, you will cause collapse of the basis of the lungs on this part. You can also form, the secretions can also form and help to form um, basal atelectasis, which means that part is collapsed and will never return. Your role is to make sure you re-expand the lungs as much as you can. Increase among the secretions can increase the risk of uh, bronchitis, even a lobar pneumonia. And those are the things you try to avoid because now you have multiple trauma to the body. Now you have, in addition to that, an infective, an infective process. That infective process now complicates your general medical condition, and now you have multiple organ damage. No, not in a non-infective state anymore. Now in an infected state. That, uh, that also now complicates the entire picture. So you try to avoid infections at all costs, especially with multiple trauma, because it can result in much more worse complications or an excessive burden on yourself when, in fact, you should have just been able to recover from the blunt trauma into the state of rehab and then finding out what your prognosis is going to be or what you aim to have as your prognosis in, in goals. What is my prognosis in the next two weeks? Am I just in bed all the time? I'm going to be in rehab the next two to three weeks. I'm going to be expected to be off work for the next three months. I'm not going to be have expected to be able to pay my bills. How do I expect to, for those to be paid? How my family is going to function in my absence? How is it I plan to cope? So if you set yourself goals or you assist your relatives in setting themselves goals and say, when do you think I'll be able to be functional? God, for God willing that we are alive and well at that, at that time. We're able to function. What is our level of functioning is going to be within the next three to four months and be realistic about it and be able to plan accordingly. So part of the goal in terms of the education as to the injuries is also to figure out what am I expected to be some of the complications of these injuries? What am I expected to do in terms of um, functions at home, in terms of the work I'm expected to do, in terms of my functions of a husband and a wife, in terms of function of taking my kids to school? What are the things I'm able to do that I was able to do before now that I cannot do? Am I going to be able to tolerate noises in the house, especially with evidence of injury to the brain, that the noise level has to drop? Do I need to be taken to the doctor every three to four days for an evaluation or a physical therapy every day? Who is going to be taking me? And those adjustments have to be made within the house. So when you evaluate your injuries, it's not only the doctors and the nursing staff will evaluate your injuries, but you also put a time frame and a perspective within your family unit as to who is going to be responsible. And at the time when the incidents are happening and the developments are taking place, it's probably the best time to discuss this. So at least somebody who says they have an interest in you at the time you're injured will have an interest in you after your, your recovery phase, and you tell them, can you assist me now and then when I'm recovering, to take me. Oh, yes, I will. And promise them that they're going to make sure that they're for you at the beginning and the end. So that's how you can ask for assistance from relatives. That is all for now. I hope this has been of assistance in terms of some of the injuries that we, some of the ways and means we can help uh, um, ascertain the degree of injury, ask the pertinent questions to our, to our medical staff, and also at the same time plan the recovery process for our relatives and do not make it a burden, make it a structured approach in which we're able to address the injuries, the recovery, and basically how is it that the family unit can work together in terms of helping that one particular person who needs the help most at that time. That is all for now.